Today on this foggy morning, we're out here to ask the question, is value priced luxury an oxymoron? Well, Genesis certainly doesn't think so with their product lineup because the G90 that we're taking a look at today is significantly less expensive than any of the competition. How significantly less expensive? Well, this starts nearly $20,000 less than a Mercedes-Benz S-Class. And if you want to comparably equip that Mercedes-Benz to what we find in the G90, the Delta grows even wider. This is even less expensive than the former value entry in the full-size luxury stand segment, the Lexus LS. And the Lexus parallels are very strong because arguably back in the 1980s, Lexus really invented the concept that luxury cars could be value priced and they could be incredibly reliable. And that's exactly what we've seen out of the Genesis brand so far. Just like Lexus did back in the 1980s, Genesis launched with two vehicles, the G90 and the G80. But Genesis is charting quite a different course from Lexus because Genesis has announced that all of their vehicles will be rear wheel drive. The G80, the G90, the G70, the upcoming SUV competitor to the Lexus RX. And things are quite different over with the Lexus product line because Lexus launched with a rear wheel drive LS, the direct competitor to this guy right here, and a front wheel drive Lexus ES that lives on. And Lexus's crossovers are also front wheel drive, the Lexus RX, the NX, and the UX. But back to the G90 that's right next to me. This received a recent refresh where we got a new front end look and a revised interior. The front end is definitely distinctive. It's definitely hungry as well. But I think this is a lot less controversial than the current generation Lexus girl. Let me know what you think about that down there in the comment section. It kind of reminds me a little bit of the diamond pattern girl that we see in the Acura lineup, but this is certainly larger and certainly hungrier. We have some very distinctive quad beam LED headlamps. In the middle of the headlamp design, we have the LED turn signal signals up front. The only thing I complain about up front is that they positioned the radar adaptive cruise control sensor right here in the middle of the grill and they have designed this plastic insert to look like the grill, but I think that it would have looked a little better if it had been placed off to the side, perhaps a little bit lower. It's always struck me funny that in a world where a $20,000 Toyota Corolla will get standard active safety technologies and standard radar adaptive cruise control, that vehicles like BMWs and Mercedes and even safety obsessed brands like Volvo don't include that kind of safety technology standard. But things are a little bit different with Genesis and of course Lexus because these two brands are including most of their active safety technology standard on every vehicle and in every trim. And that's what we see for the G90 for 2020 as well. There are still a few features that are optional and this one has everything on it, like the 360 degree camera system that will not only give you that view in the infotainment system, but also give you an image between the speedometer and tachometer as you're changing lanes. Depending on how you want to look at it, this is either the first or the second generation G90. The first generation was known as the Hyundai Equus, and that's because Hyundai is the parent company to the Genesis brand. Because it's pretty expensive to set up an entirely new luxury division, Hyundai went about things a little bit differently from the start. They tried to create luxury vehicles within the Hyundai portfolio. They created the original Hyundai Genesis, the Coupe, and the four-door, and they created the Hyundai Equus, which turned into the G90. But they realized that luxury shoppers wanted a different luxury experience. So Genesis was set up and they created the brand based on the two original models. The Genesis became the G80 and the Equus became this G90 right next to me. This is the BMW 7 Series, Audi A8, Mercedes-Benz S-Class, and Lexus LS competitor. It's about the same size as the competition, but it is the shortest entry in this segment at the moment at just over 204 inches long. Short on the outside doesn't necessarily mean small on the inside because even though this is shorter in terms of length, we have more legroom inside than we find in the Lexus LS. In the refresh of the G90, they really concentrated on the details. So we have turn signals that are integrated into the front fender right here. They have the same sort of cross hatch pattern that we find in the turn signals up front. And then we have these very, very distinctive wheels here. I'd love to know what you think about these wheels down there in the comment section. I'm seeing perhaps a little bit of Mercedes. There are some modern Mercedes wheels that are definitely very retro. And I'm certainly seeing an awful lot of perhaps 1990s Chrysler Town & Country in here as well. Moving around to the rear, you can certainly see the upright proportions that we have back there in the rear passenger area. And this rear end design reminds me a little bit of Lincoln. Let me know what you think about that down there. I don't think that's a bad thing. I think this is a very attractive look. And in my head, while driving the Genesis G90, I kept thinking to myself, this is the sedan that Ford could and should have built. This could have been something like the Lincoln Continental. But instead, the Continental sort of missed one of the important foundations for a large luxury sedan, and that is the rear seat room that we were talking about earlier. The rear seat in the Continental is pretty darn cramped, and I think that's one of the reasons that the Continental is fading off into the sunset. Down at the bottom, we have dual exhaust tips that definitely mimic that Superman shape that we saw up front. 
The tail lamp modules are full LEDs, and even though this looks like everything back here is red, the turn signals are yellow. They've just made the lenses red, so that way it all matches when the turn signals are off. Although there are certainly a lot of Lexus parallels going on here, when it comes to drivetrain technology, Genesis is a little bit more Germanic because they have much more broadly embraced turbocharging. In fact, the G90 is the only Genesis on offer in the US that has the option of a naturally aspirated engine, and it's optional, not standard. The base engine is a familiar 3.3 liter twin turbo V6. We also see that in the G70 and the G80. It produces 365 horsepower and 376 pound feet of torque. Now, this is not the most recent twin turbo V6 from Genesis. There is an all new 3.5 liter twin turbo that's going to be in their new crossover, the GV80. I expect that engine to be transplanted under this hood in relatively short order. If you want to get the top end trim of Genesis, that's going to get you this 5 liter V8. It produces 420 horsepower and 383 pound-feet of torque. You'll notice that's not that much more torque than the 3.3 liter V6 because this is a naturally aspirated V8 engine and it's the only one left in this segment. If you want a large luxury sedan in America with a naturally aspirated engine, this is the only option. And if you want a naturally aspirated V8 engine in your luxury car period in North America, you have incredibly few options. You basically have this and then you have the Lexus products that use their 5 liter V8. Regardless of engine choice, power is routed to the ground via an 8-speed automatic transmission. Rear-wheel drive is standard. All-wheel drive is optional. And as you'd expect, this is the least efficient engine available. 19 miles per gallon combined for the rear-wheel drive model we're driving, 18 if you choose the 5-liter V8 and all-wheel drive. It's worth noting that this fuel economy score is among the lowest in the large luxury sedan segment, although the 3.3-liter Twin Turbo 6 is not too bad as far as luxury sedans go. Before we dive inside, we should talk about pricing because it's important to understand how Genesis arrives at such a great value proposition. The pricing range of the G90 is very narrow. It starts at $72,200, which is again significantly less than the competition, and tops out at $78,200 significantly less than top-end trims of the competition. If you wanted to comparably equip a Lexus LS500 to the top-end all-wheel drive version of this, it would be at least $30,000 more. The way Genesis gets here is important to understand because the G90 is not going to be as configurable or as customizable, especially as the German options or as the Lexus LS. There aren't as many paint colors available. There aren't as many interior trim colors available. There aren't as many combinations of colors and trims available as well. And there are just two different trim levels. The base trim, which Genesis calls premium, comes with the 3.3 liter twin turbo V6. The top end trim, which they're calling ultimate, which gives us some of the features that we'll see in the back seat in just a moment, is called the unlimited trim, and that is the most expensive version. By keeping combinations very limited, they're able to streamline the build process, streamline inventory, and reduce costs. Genesis also doesn't have an entirely separated dealer network from Hyundai just yet. And that's why they have some other value options like their pickup and delivery service. So if you buy or lease one of these vehicles for three years and 36,000 miles when it needs service, they will pick up the vehicle, drop off a loaner vehicle to you at your work or your home, and they'll take the vehicle away, service it, and then bring it back. The important thing to remember about the competition is that giving us a smorgasbord of options is really quite expensive because the manufacturers have to produce all of those different parts. They have to inventory them, warranty them, etc. So Genesis is saving us a lot of money by giving us all those features standard. So the leather wrap dashboard, the Napa leather seats, etc. Those are all standard in the G90. They don't have to make a smorgasbord list of options and that can reduce costs. But you're not going to get the same level of customization in this that you'll be able to find in an S-Class or a 7 series where you have a wide palette of leather options and color options to choose from but they're all going to be more expensive. Front seat comfort is excellent. As you'd expect in any flagship luxury sedan these days, we have a million way adjustable driver's seat here. We have inflatable bolsters, four-way adjustable lumbar support, electrically controlled four-way adjustable headrest that is memory linked, extending thigh cushion, etc. We also have a tilt telescopic steering column. All that is linked to a two-position memory over there on the door. Two memory positions is one memory position shy of most of the competition. However, we have another button over here, which is pretty cool. It's the smart button that takes us over to the smart posture care system in the car, where you enter your height, your inseam, and your weight. We enter my data here, and then we analyze my posture, and it says we are outside of the recommended range, so it is adjusting everything for what it says I should have the car set to at six feet tall. And I have to say that's pretty comfortable, but I think I would like my back cushion to be a little bit more upright here. I can then go back into the system, 
have it analyze this position and it says that this particular position strains my back because of poor spine curvature. So I'll go ahead and use its settings and see if that makes this seat any more comfortable on a longer road trip. Now, as I said before, one of the ways costs are reduced is that the passenger seat does not have the same range of motion as the driver's seat. So we don't have the inflatable bolsters, the extending thigh cushion, etc. We do still have a four-way adjustable headrest, however. Big luxury sedans are all about big and comfortable back seats, and that's certainly what we find back here in the G90. These are power back seats as well, so this has a powered four-way adjustable headrest over here on the driver's side. We can recline the seat, and uh, we can also adjust the four-way lumbar. All those controls are contained in this folding center armrest, so you can lift it out of the way and put a fifth passenger in here if you want to, but that fifth passenger is not gonna be terribly comfortable because this is very clearly designed to seat four. The outboard seat positions are quite bucket-shaped, and it really means that this seating position is a little awkward, especially if one seat is reclined and the other isn't. Of course, the side you really wanna be on is over here on the passenger side. That's because obviously with the driver over there up front, I can't collapse that seat as far as I can. This one over here, it goes almost all the way over there to the dashboard. And then that allows the rear seat to be in much more of a reclined position. This seat also has a little bit broader range of motion than the one on the other side. You can actually lift the seat bottom cushion up to better support your legs. And this is quite comfortable. Now there's no ottoman, there are no seat massages. Those are a few things that you will find in some of the competition. Even the front seats don't offer a seat massage like we do find in something like the Lexus LS. But again, this is significantly less expensive. But when it comes to interior fit and finish, Genesis certainly doesn't cut any corners in the back. And that is something that I've noted in, for instance, the Lincoln Continental. The plastics that we find back here from the B pillars to the sides of the seats area here where the seats and the doors mate, these are all soft touch materials except just for the sill piece right there at the bottom. All the door panel parts, et cetera, here are also soft touch pieces, even the parts that you're not really looking at very closely. And of course, the bottom of the door panel as well. So everything has a much more premium feel here, just as you'd expect in a full-size luxury sedan, but definitely a step above the full-size luxury sedans that we saw from Lincoln, or even something like a Volvo S90. The S90 is kind of an odd twist because it's as long as this almost on the inside, but it is still a mid-size sedan. So the build quality is a little bit more like the Genesis G80. Rear passengers are also treated to powered window shades, that way your visage can be sheltered from the peasants. As we look around this interior, rather than my usual disclaimer, remember that most of what we're going to be seeing in here is actually standard on the G90. Above the driver and front passenger's heads, we have a pretty standard sized moonroof. No panoramic moonroof is on offer. These are vanity mirrors for the rear passengers. We see that in a number of other luxury cars there. You can also see again those powered shades for the rear passenger windows. We have height adjustable shoulder belts for the driver and front passenger, and the upper portion of the B pillar there is covered in the same Alcantara fabric that the headliner is. From this angle, you can really see how far forward that passenger seat moves. Again, the headrest almost touches the dashboard, but it's computer controlled, so that way nothing touches up there in the front. And you can see that we have very similar speaker grills front to back. These are not quite as snazzy as the speaker grills that we find in a lot of modern German luxury sedans, but they're still a step above the average sedan in America. There are actually three ways to control the front passenger seat. You can control it from the back, from the normal seat controls, or from these two buttons here, so that way you can slide it forward and backward for rear passenger comfort. The G90 has standard Napa leather seats. These are heated and ventilated. We have that interesting crosshatch pattern there. Generally speaking, you have to work your way up into Napa leather in even the more expensive German luxury stands. If you move on over to the front doors, again, this is entirely made of soft touch materials with very few exceptions, like right there around those window switches, for instance, and of course the speaker grill, that's not a soft touch plastic. Along the top of the door, you can see that we have the stitched leather going on up there, the piping, the real wood trim, memory positions right there for the passenger seat. There's also a tweeter right there at the front of the door. This vehicle has a Lexicon sound system. They're very proud to say that Lexicon has sound systems only in Genesis vehicles and some ultra premium vehicles like Rolls Royces. More real wood trim going right there across the dashboard. The glove compartment is a somewhat compact bin style compartment. I was not able to fit a larger tablet computer inside. One of the changes in the refresh is this touchscreen infotainment system. It's set pretty far away from the driver, but it is a touchscreen, so that makes interacting with it an awful lot easier, especially if you like to use Apple CarPlay or Android Auto. 
And Apple CarPlay uses the entire screen, which is a little bit different from most modern versions of the Mercedes infotainment system, where Apple CarPlay just uses a small center portion. They've also revised the Genesis infotainment software, so things look a little bit different than they did before. It still has a different color scheme than we find in other vehicles that share very similar software. The mapping interface and the base software is related to what we see in the Hyundai and Kia product line, and that's really an advantage for Genesis. Because as we've seen in small volume companies like Jaguar, Land Rover, Alfa Romeo, etc., their software ends up pretty buggy when they're trying to do it themselves. And this is very clean, easy to use, and it also is really snappy. It's pretty easy to see as we move around this system that responsiveness is definitely key here. But you'll notice one of the other differences between this and some luxury cars is that this is a three zone, not a four zone automatic climate control system. That's another area where costs have been cut a little bit. This is the smart posture care screen I was telling you about earlier. So you can enter your height, your inseam length, your weight right there. And then once that information has been entered into the system, we'll just click all through that. We can have it analyze the posture. Now I've adjusted the seats so that way I can fit the camera in the car. So obviously it says things are outside the recommended range. Let's see if I can hit this without knocking the camera over. You can see now has adjusted the seat to the recommended posture. We can view details. You can see that that's their recommended posture there. And then if I adjust the seat, it will analyze the posture once the seat has stopped moving. So there we go. So it thinks that's still okay. If I lower the front of the seat all the way down, oh, still okay. Now if I tilt the seat back or adjust the curvature, etc., then you'll notice things are there in different categories. Once you've decided that you either like or dislike the seat position, you can have it save, you can go back, or you can adjust the posture back to what the car says you should have. Because an analog clock is a must-have in any luxury vehicle, we find one right there below the infotainment system, two large air vents, some physical buttons for that infotainment system, and then physical buttons for the front two climate control zones. Below that, we find another button bank here. This is where we find the button for the 360-degree camera system. The 360-degree camera system uses the entire screen right there, so we have the 360 layout over here on the right, and then whatever camera view you want. On that other side, you can do forward view, you can do reverse view, you can also adjust the views for sort of a downward view right there in the back that's expanded, or you can click that over and get the side-by-side -side view. Below that, we have the parking sense button, auto brake hold, the drive mode selector. This allows us to choose between sport, eco, custom, and comfort. When we move over to the sport mode, it'll inflate the bolsters, which is a nice touch. We have a joystick style shifter here, shift button right there on that side. There's a park button right up front. Over here is a little storage cubby where you can keep your smartphone. There is a Qi wireless charging mat, but you'll notice that if you want to use CarPlay, it's not wireless and that does stick out a little bit. So you can't really close that door right there on your smartphone. This is the infotainment controller. If you'd rather not use the touchscreen, you can use the controller. I think it's pretty intuitive to use both methods. It's not quite as designed around the controller as we see BMW's iDrive system, but this is definitely better adapted than the Lexus pointer stick or trackpad. These are the controls for the heated or ventilated seats right here. We have a heated steer wheel button and then a button for the rear window shade. On this side, we have two pretty decently sized cup holders, and then there's a wood lid that closes right on top. On the driver's side, we have a heads up display. These are always notoriously difficult to film, so don't worry, it's actually pretty crisp in person, but cameras really make it look strangely fuzzy. And the projection module is relatively discreet. It doesn't stick up like a huge bump like we see in some luxury cars. I was a little bit disappointed that this refresh didn't bring us a full LCD instrument cluster like we're going to see in upcoming Genesis models, but the display is still pretty easy to read. It's not as fully functional as we find in full LCDs in the competition. So things focus primarily around the trip computer right there, active safety readouts, and turn-by-turn -turn navigation directions. This display is also where you'll find the turn signal activated camera for the left and the right. That's a really handy feature. I love the fact that we have this here rather than putting it in the infotainment system like we see in some other cars. This system also does not replace the typical blind spot monitoring. So we have traditional radar based blind spot monitoring and the camera system. So you have both sources of information. The steering wheel is a leather wrapped four spoke design and the spokes are leather wrapped as well. So the center sections all the way in there, the airbag cover, and then the wrap around these areas are all leather. On the back of the steering wheel, we have shift paddles up on the right, down over there on the left, but they're not metal paddles, they are plastic. On the right side of the wheel, we have the controls for the radar adaptive cruise control system, as well as this roller selector and then page change button for that multifunction LCD instrument cluster. And then over here on this side, we have the controls for the infotainment system. A nice touch is that we have dedicated track up and down buttons right here. That may sound odd, but for some reason, you don't find dedicated track forward backward buttons in all the luxury competition. 
In our zero to 60 testing, this model came in at 4.9 seconds of drama-free acceleration. That's about the same as the BMW 740i. It's a little bit slower than the LS500. Bear in mind that with the Lexus lineup, the LS500 is the entry point and it's the most powerful model as well. If you offer the optional hybrid LS, then it's a little bit slower, but it's also gonna be more expensive. This is, however, a little bit faster zero to 60 than a Mercedes S450. In our braking test, this model stopped from 60 miles an hour back to zero in 120 feet. We have relatively wide tires on here, 245s up front, 275s in the rear, but these tires are not focused on sporty pretensions, they're focused on giving you a good ride and a good balance between handling and ride quality, also a quiet cabin. When it comes to handling, it's important to keep those tires and their mission in mind. This is not going to handle like an F-Sport version of the LS500 or the AMG versions of the Mercedes-Benz S-Class or anything like that. But when comparing this against base models of the competition, this really does hold its own. And that's the important thing to keep in mind, is that the G90 is priced less than everybody else in this segment. Even this absolute top-end trim is less expensive than the least expensive BMW 7 Series or the Mercedes-Benz S-Class. So with that in mind, I think the G90 does extremely well. This is not gonna have the same level of polish that we find in some of the Germans or in the LS500, to be honest. The LS500 is a really, really well-designed suspension, but I think the rest of the attributes in the G90, especially the price tag, compensate largely for that. But the difference is not enormous. We're talking about a little bit of extra polish in the Lexus, but not night and day. Bearing all that in mind, I'm gonna give handling a B plus. If you're comparing this to price similar options in the luxury segment, then you might be considering this against something like a Volvo S90 T8. It's gonna be in a similar price range to this, but the handling is gonna be quite different. That delivers 400 horsepower total, but 316 are coming from the front wheels and the rest are coming from the rear wheels. So it's never gonna have the same kind of driving dynamic that the G90 does. But it does feel a little bit lighter and a little bit more nimble sometimes out on the road. It just depends on what road you're on. And obviously, if you compare this to something like a price similar BMW 5 Series, that's gonna be smaller, or a Mercedes-Benz E-Class, again, smaller on the inside and on the outside, they are gonna feel better out on the road, they're gonna be a little bit more nimble, a little bit sportier, but they're also gonna be smaller and not the same kind of thing. The adaptive suspension system in the G90 is a little bit different than the adaptive suspensions we find in some of the competition. It's not uncommon in the full-size luxury stance segment to have a full adaptive air suspension that can adjust the vehicle's height, it can adjust the damping, and it can adjust the spring rate. Those vehicles are riding on basically airbags. The air system replaces the traditional spring as well as the damper in the suspension system. This has more of a traditional suspension design with an adaptive damper setup. This system cannot adjust quite as many parameters as the available suspensions that we find in the luxury segment, like some of the systems in the Mercedes-Benz S-Class that has an optional predictive suspension system or the adaptive air suspension in the LS500. But the G90 still delivers a very polished ride. Because damping is adjustable, but the spring rate is not in the G90 suspension, this is never gonna be as firm as some of those competitive suspensions when you put them in their most aggressive sport modes. But things definitely still firm up when you're out on the road and you put it in the sport mode. Again, that also changes the throttle mapping and it inflates the bolsters in the driver's seat. In our cabin noise testing at 50 miles an hour, we measured 69 decibels in here. That means this is a hair louder than the Mercedes-Benz S-Class or the Lexus LS, but right in keeping with the Audi A8. When it comes to fuel economy, I have been a little bit surprised. According to the EPA, we should be averaging 19 miles per gallon combined, but we've been averaging 21 and a half over a week of mixed driving. That's significantly better than the EPA says, but it is still below something obviously like the Lexus LS hybrid or the plug-in hybrids that we do find occasionally from the Germans. And of course, if you're cross-shopping this against something like the Volvo S90, that is going to be significantly more fuel efficient. That should average you 27 to 28 miles per gallon while also giving you an electric driving range. But keep in mind, the G90 is significantly less expensive than most of those hybrid options. So when it comes to fuel economy, I'm gonna give this a B. Keep in mind that your fuel economy will obviously vary based on your driving style. And if you're having too much fun with this five liter V8, then fuel economy is gonna drop. In a way, the G90 represents an endangered species. It wasn't that long ago in America that you could find a large rear wheel drive sedan with a cushy suspension and a healthy V8 under the hood. But those days really are long gone. We no longer have large softly sprung Cadillacs. The Lincoln Continental has gone off into the sunset and the Chrysler 300 and Dodge Charger, they're just not the same thing. They're not as big as the sedans they replaced in the lineup, the Chrysler LHS for instance. They're not as big as this G90 and they're certainly not as softly sprung either. 
it seems like most companies out there, when they're designing their big sedans or their flagship sedans, they're trying to focus on driving precision and absolute handling ability. We see that, for instance, in the Cadillac CT6. They didn't just give up the cushy ride, they also gave up a big back seat. And that's part of why I think the CT6 is also riding off into the sunset. But the G90, on the other hand, is refreshingly and unapologetically softly sprung, and I really like that. Now, even in the sport mode, we're definitely getting a bit of wallow, a little bit of tip and dive out here on this winding mountain road, but that doesn't mean that the G90 handles poorly. This can really grip and go when you want it to. You can carve this road like nobody's business. You're just going to be leaning a bit more into the corners, and the tires are going to be groaning a bit more at you. Now, in case you didn't know, I do love large, softly sprung sedans. I've owned three of them that were over 200 inches long, so sort of in this same size category as the G90. In many ways, the G90 reminds me of a classic large American luxury sedan. It certainly has the ride quality, the presence, the comfort on the inside, the quiet cabin, the power, and the reasonable sticker price as well. So if you're sad that Cadillac or Lincoln never really made a worthy flagship for those brands, Genesis would love to sell you a G90. Since the G90 launched, its price tag has continually ratcheted upwards, and at this point in time, the base price of the 3.3 liter model with rear wheel drive at $72,200 is about as expensive as the very top end model from just a few years ago. That top end model is gonna get the five liter V8, the ultimate trim that we were driving, and all wheel drive. That will be $78,200. That is significantly below the starting price of the majority of the competition. The G90 is all about value, value, value. And the price tag does not really represent the quality of materials that we find in the G90 or its performance out on the road, but the price tag does represent this value proposition for Genesis because of the way they get there. You'll notice on this pricing list that there aren't a ton of options. All G90 models are very well equipped. There aren't too many colors to choose from on the inside or on the outside. All those features are bundled. If you want the ultimate trim, you have to get the five liter V8. If you want the premium trim, you have to get the 3.3 liter turbo. All that lends to the value of the G90. That lends the question, can value be a luxury attribute? Because the very value proposition of the G90 means that it's not as customizable, not as configurable, not as personalizable, if that's a word, as a Lexus LS500, which is in itself not as configurable as a BMW 7 Series or an Audi A8 or a Mercedes-Benz S-Class. There's not as much variation in these vehicles as we would see in the European models. For instance, there are a ton of different hide colors you can choose from on the Mercedes-Benz S-Class, tons of standalone options. Your S-Class is not gonna be the same as the S-Class that ends up parking next to you at a stoplight, but with the Genesis G90, they're going to be very similar. I'm not gonna run through our usual comparison section here because honestly, when it comes to full-size luxury sedans, brand plays an incredibly important issue. And so does budget in a way, because the budget of someone that's looking at a Genesis between 72 dollars and $78,000 is quite different than someone that's looking at a Mercedes-Benz S-Class that starts about $100,000, so starts about $20,000 more and won't have nearly the same kind of options that you'd find on that very top-end Genesis G90. In fact, if you were to comparably equip a Mercedes-Benz S-Class to have the feature set that we had in our G90 this week, it would be $60,000, $80,000 more than the Genesis, depending on exactly how you wanted to comparably equip them. And that makes discussing the G90 a little bit tricky here. Would I buy the G90 over a Lexus LS? I think I would at this point in time. I like the G90 a little bit better. I like its styling. I like the value proposition. I like the fact that Genesis is really trying hard in this particular segment. I would probably also buy the G90 if I were putting my own money on the line over an S-Class or a 7 Series or an A8, but that's because I don't have that kind of budget. I'm a little bit cheaper, of course, and the badge is less important to me. But that does not mean that the G90 is better than them. Is the LS ostensibly better than the G90? In some ways, I would argue that it is. The Lexus LS has great performance. It has great handling. It has better seats, I think, than the G90, especially the massage that's available in those seats. But the Lexus comparison is probably the easiest here because the price tag is a little bit closer and Genesis definitely seems to be going after Lexus with the G90. I think that in terms of parts quality and fit and finish, the two vehicles are honestly pretty equal. And I like the gadgets better in the G90 than in the Lexus LS. The heads-up display in the Lexus LS is absolutely fantastic, but the infotainment system feels a little bit behind. And the instrument cluster also doesn't feel quite as snazzy as the instrument clusters that we find in the European competition. Competition, so I don't really rank it too differently than the instrument cluster we find in the G90, which is in itself a little bit behind 
some of the other Genesis models that we see coming out here soon. But when we start talking about the S-Class or the 7 Series or the A8, it's hard to have these vehicles really in the same segment. The European options are going to be so much more expensive. They're so much more configurable. They've got tons of options to choose from that are just not available on the G90. Obviously, the G90 has the big win in terms of value. It also seems to be very reliable. Reliability has been absolutely excellent for the Genesis brand. The fit and finish, the build quality is absolutely excellent. They've got a great customer care program, a long warranty, etc. But a lot of those factors don't really seem to play into the purchase decisions for large full-size luxury sedans. Brand is obviously a major consideration in this kind of purchase. That's really obvious when you take a look, especially at customer loyalty within that large full-size sedan segment. And that leads me to ask all of you what you would choose in this particular segment. Now, when you take a look at the sales numbers, it really does seem like Genesis has a lead here. They've definitely stolen sales from Lexus, not so much from the European competition, but certainly from the Lexus brand when you take a look at the sales numbers. Let me know what you think about all that down there in the comment section below. And of course, let me know, do you think value can be a luxury attribute or is value and, and luxury, are they polar opposites of one another? What do you think about that? Let me know down there in the comment section below and I'll see all of you later.